Three years. It has been three years since I first installed Skyrim, and it hasn't gone anywhere that whole time. My Skyrim folder has been through a presidential election, a devastating hurricane, years of revolutions and uprisings and socioeconomic reform. My Skyrim folder has seen me graduate college and get a job and bicycle across the country and gain a bunch of weight and start this whole bunny hop thing, and even though I barely played it past that first year after launch, I haven't really had the guts to uninstall it because I never finished the main quest, until just a few nights ago. For me, there's a kind of finality to finishing the main quest in an Elder Scrolls game. It's my own personal way of saying that I feel like I'm done, that it's finally time to wrap that crazy ride up and put it all behind me and see what else is going to take me 120 hours to do. But after that grand, epic final battle of the main quest, you can return to one of the important characters and he says this. Will you be a hero whose name is remembered in song throughout the ages? Or will your name be a curse to future generations? You know what, dude? Listen, a ang anglers, I'm done. I'm finished. And you know what else? That's one weird-ass speech to be giving at the end of a game. You usually hear the requisite, Are you a douchebag or a cool dude? speech at the beginning of Western RPGs like this. I understand that the freeform nature of an Elder Scrolls game means that you can end the game whenever you damn well please, and that you can bypass the main quest and this speech if you damn well please, but it still feels like it's placed at a very wrong part of this story. Up to this point, you have had plenty of opportunities to go off the beaten path away from the main quest, and you should have been doing that. That is how this game is designed. Almost every Elder Scrolls game is built to distract you with daisy chains of little emergent moments of story and gameplay that gradually build up to hours of player-driven exploration. These games are designed to liberate you from the linearity of a rigid predefined story and play structure, but they do provide that experience in the main quests. But one recurring problem I kept noticing with Skyrim's main quest is that it assumes that you're not going to get distracted. At the very end of its story, it assumes that you haven't already acted out 120 hours of douchebag or cool dude behavior. I'm sure we all have thought about how weird Skyrim's intro is, how it's very different from the rest of the game, and how it evokes qualities that don't represent the core of the game, while unintentionally spoiling the flow of the first few story events. That's a problem that the main quest of Skyrim keeps suffering from over and over again. It mismanages the flow and the timeliness of its story. It's poorly paced. It constantly encourages you to rush to the next objective with dialogue lines that try their hardest to reinforce a sense of urgency. You'd better get up to High Hrothgar immediately. There is no refusing the summons of the Greybeards. Meet me at the Solitude Stables after you've arranged things with Melbourne. Any questions? Kynesgrove. There's an ancient dragon burial near there. If we can get there before it happens, maybe we'll learn how to stop it. But that urgency is a lie. It's an Elder Scrolls game, and just like all the others, everyone is going to wait indefinitely for you forever, because you're supposed to leave them waiting while you run off collecting cheese wheels or whatever. I find it really unfortunate that despite how much talent and skill went into making Skyrim, I ultimately became bored with it because of the shallowness behind everything. The game's environment looks incredible, the lore is full of a rich history with lots of interesting stories to tell, and a couple of the music tracks are so imposing and powerful that you can't help but just stop and shiver while listening to them. For the past three years, whenever I'd load up Skyrim, I'd just look around at how beautiful everything is and just say, wow, why don't I play this game more often? And then a few minutes later, I'd always end up rediscovering why. No amount of mods can fix the problem of how every character in Skyrim seems like the most boring character in Skyrim. It's hard to keep playing when every quest they give you is the most boring quest they give you, with the most boring combat and the most Much boring voice acting and the most boring dungeon crawling with the most boring enemies. It's really unfortunate that of all the other things that could have killed Skyrim, it was boring writing that killed the game for me. Just looking around this world is enough to show you that it had so much more potential than that. With a good dose of self-awareness and variety, Skyrim could have been the high point of the series. 
but I don't want to hate on it too hard. It did a hell of a lot better of a job than Oblivion did, and I feel that all of its success was well deserved. But I can't really say that the time I put into it felt more rewarding than the time I put into Morrowind. And, and no, that's not nostalgia speaking. I didn't actually play through all the major quest lines of Morrowind until after Skyrim came out. And it's not hard for me to say that Morrowind itself is far from perfect. Even after you get used to missing your swings more often than hitting, and even after you get used to how people just stand rigidly in one spot 24-7, and even after you get used to how frustratingly slow your starting walking speed is, you're still dealing with a lot of the same problems that Skyrim has. It's a heavily detailed, slow-burning sandbox that suffers from a lack of central focus. But it embraces its open, explorable world and the deep lore of that world in a way that Skyrim does not. And it does that by making all of its side quest distractions cooperate with the main quest, rather than grinding them against the main quest. The main quest in Morrowind doesn't have that sense of fake urgency because it locks up higher tiers of quests by difficulty instead of scaling it all to the player. There are moments where it actually tells you to take a break from the main quest to join a guild, explore the countryside, and level up to go on smaller, lesser adventures before continuing on. And going out and consuming all that optional content is probably the one way you are supposed to play these games. The non-main quest content in every Elder Scrolls game absolutely dwarfs the main quest by comparison. And Morrowind's main quest actually encourages you to go out and find it. It wants to immerse you in the politics and the economics of its world in a way that Skyrim couldn't really manage. And I think fast travel has a lot to do with it. Early on in Morrowind, you had to learn how the public transportation system worked. You had to save up money for bus fare on your way home from quests. And once you got the hang of that, the main quest did something wonderful when it asked you to venture out into a part of the map that is undeveloped and doesn't have that transportation infrastructure. Suddenly, you're not using mounts, ferries, or even roads to travel, but instead vague landmarks and written directions. You have to use your own wits to get around. You become embedded with a more primitive faction, and you learn the ways of their people and come to rely on them in a mechanical way, because their canonical separation from the outside world affects you mechanically. It affects how you travel, how you heal yourself, how you manage resources, and what you do with the land around you. And that's part of the reason why I've always thought that the story and the lore behind Morrowind has a bit of a philosophical depth to it that the sequels don't have. Just like in Skyrim, you're fulfilling an ancient heroic prophecy, but I almost want to say that Morrowind goes for a more realistic tone than Skyrim. Which is weird, because there's like magic and stuff, but, but hear me out here. Much like in real life, the various leaders of Morrowind interpret and remember history differently from one another. The land that Morrowind takes place in is a really complicated melting pot of individually motivated tribes, companies, empires, and guilds who have their own lineup of self-motivated leaders that give cause for internal conflicts in each one. And though they all end up supporting you in the end, which is the primary goal of the main quest, they all do it for different reasons and they expect different outcomes. The main quest gives you a kind of interpretive and critical way of looking at prophecy and religion that constantly asks you to question whether or not the events happening here are actually supernaturally orchestrated. You might really be the divine reincarnation of a long-dead god-king, but it's equally likely that you're just some guy who happened to show up at the right time and place. For example, when you happen to fulfill the prophecy of being immune to the plague, it's not because anyone upstairs directly made you immune, as far as you can tell, but rather because you happen to be a lucky test subject for a drug that hides the plague symptoms while still thoroughly and completely infecting you. Your eventual godlike powers come more from the support of enchanted artifacts rather than latent bodily abilities. Compare it to Skyrim where you have the power to absorb dragon souls because you are the dragonborn. Why are you the dragonborn? I don't know, you were born that way. I, I guess it's just necessary for the story to happen. The main quest of Morrowind has you memorizing lines of scripture and interpreting religious philosophies and influencing how the political processes on this island work. It has you uniting all of the conflicted organizations of its world against one greater threat, and in order to do that, you have to complete a list of interesting non-combat objectives
motives that help you understand the world and its characters. One moment you're bribing and grinding up on the leader of one faction, the next minute you're arranging a marriage for another. Most of the objectives of Morrowind's main quest are held by people on the overworld, and they ask you to engage with other people on the overworld to get what you need to progress. On the other hand, Skyrim is more content to just put the items you need at the end of dungeon crawls. But for Morrowind's main quest, dungeon crawling is the exception, not the norm for how it gets you to accomplish stuff. And combat has never been the primary strength of an Elder Scrolls game. It's always been about world building and immersive qualities, and Skyrim does have those in spades. But it wasn't written or designed to really take advantage of them. You might notice just how few ideas were put into building this game when you see that the very last dungeon you crawl through has the same exact enemies as the first. And despite how well Skyrim looks, there are all sorts of technological issues that keep it from telling its story in a truly convincing and dramatic way. During a few really quite important parts in the story, characters will talk over each other or get stuck on terrain. These are Akaviri symbols. Here, let's see. You had the symbol for king. Stand together At Sovngarde's gates, I'll meet my fate with mercy. It's even more cringy when they get drowned out by the soundtrack. You fought well. Find you. It is long since one of the living Morrowind's wiki-style dialogue system is not an ideal solution either, but at least it doesn't have that problem. Instead of trying and failing to engineer grand battles or impressive scripted events, Morrowind puts the burden of spectacle on the player. You actually feel like you're a reincarnated god king, because by the end of the game you're flying between cities and teleporting across the map, and you actually have a frame of reference to know how awesome that is, because in the beginning you had to take the bus like everyone else. At the end of Morrowind's main quest, all the NPCs talk to you differently. The hostile Sixth House followers start acting polite, a whole enemy type just drops dead all of a sudden, and you entirely wipe one of the weather conditions out of the system. But at the end of Skyrim's main quest, nothing else really changes. The dragons are still flying around, causing trouble, and you can pick up the Civil War quest right where you left off. The villains and the heroes of Skyrim's main quest are written out to be underground actors, who the bigger politicians of Skyrim must remain unaware of, which means that you emerge from the main quest without gaining any real recognition for your victory. And it just feels like lazy writing. The game really plays up the significance of that final battle, but it doesn't see it through. You're traveling across dimensions to Viking heaven to confront those you killed and to band together Skyrim's most legendary heroes to end the soul of an immortal existence-eating dragon demigod. But this is how it ends up playing out. It's a situation that manages to feel like it should be important and meaningful, but it ends up not, mostly because it's executed with flaccid production values. On the other hand, Morrowind's main quest has barely any of the production values of Skyrim at all, but it manages to do more with less. It doesn't just get you to more thoroughly travel than Skyrim's, but it gets you to think about what those travels mean. It stimulates you mentally, and it makes you play like the godlike hero it's playing you up to be. It encourages you to take advantage of the open, explorable world and the interesting stories that this universe has to tell. And it does it tastefully. It gives you a good dose of really interesting, complicated pragmatism compared to the story in Skyrim, which is a good deal more simple and naive. Which doesn't have to be a bad thing, but when you make a world as large and complex as Tamriel actually is, it seems like it would be hard for it not to have large and complex problems. It also doesn't help that Skyrim's main quest seems to want to rush you past its beautiful world at a really fast pace. It ignores several of the major settlements on the map, and it gets really janky, technically, towards the end. When you compare the two, it's a long way away from capturing the imagination and the intelligence that went into Morrowind. 